Today we want to try and cover two next steps in uh, factor analysis. Nested invariance testing is, is the model the same for all subgroups or is it the same for sample one and sample two? Simple logic. And the second thing we'll deal with later is uh, a variation on path modeling and structural equation modeling for repeated measures. So that's what we're going to get through to. Okay. The fundamental thing is we live in a global world. Oh, whoops. I live in this country here. We actually are on the map, even if IKEA forgets to put us on their map. Um, you know, the IKEA Swedish company, they have maps of the world and often New Zealand is not on the map. And the size of New Zealand is about the size of Italy, only upside down. And the population of New Zealand is only not even 5 million people, so less than Moscow. But my instrument, because of my publications in the world, people from different places in the world, and this, if you imagine, this is here. So it's pointing at Hong Kong and China, uh, Spain, uh, Egypt, America, Brazil, have, thanks to the power of the internet, said, ooh, that looks interesting, can I use it? And I always say, yes, of course you can use it. Of course, I want to be cited and famous. So, yes, you can use it. The problem is, it came from here, does that mean it's going to work there? And the way we do that is to test the model, does it configurably match, and then are the observed differences greater than you would see by chance? And that's fundamentally all we're doing, is we're looking at things like confidence intervals to say, Yes, the two numbers are not the same, but they confidence intervals overlap, so let's act as if they're the same. Okay? It's that simple is the logic. So when you adapt an instrument, say, oh, I really want to use Gavin's instrument because I think it's really interesting and people have been using it. So you would do language checking, you would translate it, you would check it backwards, you would test it for functional equivalence. You do all the standard things to say, does this fit? Uh, the International Test Commission has some very good guidelines on adaptation and translation, so you should familiarize yourself with those. But even if you do an amazing job of making Gavin's instrument fit Russia or Azerbaijan or most wherever, that doesn't mean the environment in which you're going to administer it is the same. Policies, cultures, histories, and societies differ, sometimes in small ways, but many times in big ways. Changes in the language are often an indicator that something else is different too. If you think about the English-speaking countries, probably the largest English-speaking country in the world is India. India is not the same as England. England is not the same as America where we talk about the same language separating us because we all, because words mean different things in those two countries. So, when a, so you cannot assume that Gavin's inventory translated will solve the same way in my population. And if you chain it changes, you're increasing the probability the solution will be different. And so the way factor analysis does this is with multi-group confirmatory factor analysis. So we're saying we're doing a confirmatory factor analysis, but now we're going to see if group A and group B are the same. So this is the perfect world where you find a second sample, you develop a model, it works. And you, then you get a second sample from the same population. Okay? So you have to think about, what is my population? Oh, my population in one study was primary school teachers. 
and I did a second star survey with high school teachers in the same country. So the question is, are high school teachers and primary school teachers in New Zealand from two different populations, or are they from one population? Are they just samples of the same population? If they're from the same population, then the model should be invariant. But if I go from New Zealand to Brazil, well, so many things are different, socially, economically, historically, linguistically, that maybe the model won't work. Okay? So lack of invariance does not disprove the instrument if the samples are from different populations. If you get two samples from the same population, high school student one, high school student two, and then compare them, from the same country, and the model is not invariant, then maybe the model is wrong, it's not stable. But if it's invariant, then that's kind of proof that in this population, the model works. Okay? You're taking advantage of chance in your data, in the sample you had, to create a model. And that's why new instrument development should probably always have two samples from the same population. And that's why if you got a thousand people, you might split the model randomly into two groups of 500 to save having to go and collect more data. It's also a reason why you would use internet data collection. Because usually you can get more people who answer on computer or a phone than on paper and it's usually cheaper, and you don't have to do data entry, so there's a lot of reasons to use the technology to get more data quickly. Yes? But, uh, if we compare those two samples, so we uh, check invariance, but we also uh, check all other psychometric properties of instruments in both samples. Mm. Well, in factor analysis, we're going to check a number of pro pro properties of the parameters, not just the model is the same. We're going to actually systematically look at are the regression weights the same? Are the intercepts the same? And we can even look, are the residuals the same? So there's a lot of things we can do in factor analysis to test, is the model the same? And I'm going to talk about that. So it's not, this, so it's not just, it works! That's not proof that it's the same. That just means it works but that doesn't prove the samples are from the same population and behave the same way. So, invariance is a strong indicator that the two samples, two or more samples, are from the same population. But if you already know the samples are from different populations, should the model be invariant? My argument is that if the populations are not the same, then the samples should behave differently. A lot of psychologists will argue without invariance the model is, the inventory is no good. But they're using 250 university students this year and 180 students the next year. Of course they want invariance because these are students in my university compared to students in my university and the university didn't suddenly change, so the samples are really from the same population. But very different populations, maybe invariance is impossible. And that doesn't mean your instrument is broken, it just means it doesn't work over there. It works here, but it doesn't work over there. So we have to be really cautious about what invariance expectations we have. If a model is invariant, it still doesn't mean the scores for the factors are going to be the same. Okay? The invariance is in the equation of how the latent relates to the manifest. You can have a different starting point, you can have a different overall mean, but still have an invariant model.
Okay. The two groups could have different means, but the model is invariant. Obviously, when you have two groups, the actual scores are likely not to be the same. The actual regression weight could be different because we don't expect identical. What we're expecting is identical plus or minus chance within the confidence interval. So here's the thing. If you have a small sample, the confidence interval is big, so it's more likely to overlap. But you're less likely to get a solution. If you have big samples, your confidence intervals are small, you're more likely to find the difference is beyond chance. Right? So you need big samples to get accurate estimation, but you get narrow confidence intervals, so a small difference could be statistically significant. It's one of these damned if you do and damned if you don't. You don't have the effect size? Sorry? Do we have the effect size for this? Yes. If theory and empirical research can explain the different relations, then the model is detecting real world differences. So if your samples are from different populations and your model is not invariant, it's saying people from these different conditions really are different. Okay? It's detecting that. So here's an example from a study that uh, my colleague and I published in 2009. We had this model that said the relationship of this factor to this was invariant for one, two, three groups. But this fourth group, it was not invariant. So three of the groups behaved in the same way, but the fourth group, you can see this line has to disappear because these two factors were highly correlated in this group. And you can't say 474 is too small. It's not a sample size problem. So what we had to do was actually go back and read the literature that says, how do Maori students in our country experience assessment? And it is different according to the culture, education, culture, research people. And what we found here is when we added ethnicity, that uh, invariant factor loadings, no real difference for the three groups. And what we found is that the three groups, the structural model was invariant. What's interesting is the measurement model, these items and their, these factors and their items, was invariant, but the structural model was not invariant. Okay? So I've measured it the same. It's the same for everybody. But how these things influence performance is different according to the group. Okay, so invariance can be at the measurement level, invariance can be at the structural level. I've measured this thing, I've tested it against all the groups, it's fine. But as soon as I add it to a structural model, oh my god, it's different. Maybe it means these people have different relations. And, and here you say um, CFR says equivalent, but uh, high square says reject. Yeah. These are two approaches that says, and we'll talk about them specifically, the change in CFI was zero. The change in CFI was 0.01, that's okay. The change is zero, zero. These, these changes are generally considered acceptable. But this change in the chi-square went changed by 14. This changed by 14. So the P is 0.45 because it's one chi-square for one degree of freedom. Of course it's going to be okay. But that the next step, it was 75, and 36, 36 and 75 is less than 0.05. So 
sometimes the statistics don't tell you the same thing. So you have to make your mind up which statistical approach you're going to trust. And I don't trust chi-square when I have big ends. Right? You know, one, almost 2,000, 300, 700, 500. I got big ends. I'm not, I don't like the chi-square test. So I tend to trust the change in CFI, and I'll, I'll explain this. So, every CFA produces a set of indices. If the indices change within chance when the constraint is made, then we say the observed difference is within chance. We can say adding that constraint is true. Equivalence is needed for four things to really, sorry, three things to be able to say this model is equivalent. Not identical, equivalent. Okay? Slight difference. Equivalence starts with configurable. Are all the paths, all the latents, all the items, is everything the same in terms of what paths, what's, what was set to seed value, what was free, what covariances, what regressions. If they're all identical, then the RMSEA should be acceptable. Metric says, let's first see if the regressions are the same. Remember, a latent trait has a linear relationship. This is the standardized value is B. So what we're saying is, here's group one and group, group two and group one. Is the beta value for every item more or less the same between the two groups? Or three groups, or five groups, or ten groups, right? Lots of groups. The, the number of groups doesn't really matter here. But what matters is, is Beta number one, the same for group one and two. What about beta number two? Let's look at every beta in the model from a latent trait to an item and compare them between group one and two. And if they overlap, then we can say beta, beta for group one is equal to beta for group two. Overlap, you mean confidence intervals? Sorry? Overlap. You mean confidence intervals? Yes. Uh, Overlap. Because beta 0.75, confidence interval 70 to 80. Next one is 77, confidence interval 72 uh, to 82. Well, those overlap. So we could say the difference is within chance. If we roll the dice 95 times in 100, the numbers would overlap. Five times in a hundred, they would. So, that's the first thing we want to say. But of course, because it's a regression, remember day one? Regression has an intercept value. I want to know if the latent trait, this is to use IRT symbol, theta, if the latent trait is zero, what's your starting point on this item? Now this could be an expression of bias. It could be a, an expression of social desirable starting point. It could be the, I'm a very happy and optimistic person, so I always give myself a high number. I'm a depressed and sad and angry person, and I always give a low number because the world sucks and I hate the world, you know? So different people behave in a different way. So now we're looking at the group, group one, group two. Is the intercept more or less the same when we start, when the latent variable is zero? So we set all the latent variables to zero, and it looks to see what's the intercept for this group, for that group. And remember what an analysis of variance is doing. It's there's the mean, but there's the spread. 
There's the mean, there's the spread. Do these differ by more than chance, given how much they overlap? That's what it's going to do for the group. It's going to look at the observed midpoint and the spread and say, look, these overlap for every item in this measurement model. And we call that scalar equivalence. Regression weights was the metric equivalence. So if you're thinking about how does a scale work, the items should have the same regression and the same starting points. The groups should have the same regression weights, the same starting points for the set of items that we're considering. To be in and this is called weak invariance. This is strong invariance. So people will talk about strict invari strong invariance and weak invariance. Strict invariance is if the residuals, remember, because in our model we also have, we also have this. So now we want to know is strictly are the is the amount in the residual the same? Because that might differ independently by chance. And the research literature says no one cares. You might find it, but you don't need it. But you do need configural, weak, and strong invariance to say my model behaves the same way for these two groups. Does that make sense? And the trick is we test each step separately and sequentially. So if I have the same configural, I'm allowed to test for metric equivalence. If I have metric equivalence, I can test for scalar equivalence. If I don't have metric equivalence, you can't go any further. Okay? Each step must go, yup, that's more or less the same. Yup, that's more or less the same. Yup, that's more or less the same. If you get a no, too bad, so sad, you stop. And so in that, in that case, if you have to stop, what does it mean? It means you only have a partial or no equivalence, depending on where in the process you stopped. There is one time when metric equivalence is sufficient. And that's when you have repeated measures over time. Same people, so it's not a different sample, it's just a different time. And I want to know, does my model work time one to time two? Especially if I did an intervention in between, I expect something to change for the experiment group. And that's probably going to be seen in the scalar. So in a time one, time two, pre-post-test, experiment control group, you could be satisfied if there is metric equivalence, time one, time two, group one, group two, in the second time point. At the first time point, you want configural, metric, and scalar, because you want to know my random assignment control experiment meant that people answered my questionnaire in the same way. There's no systematic difference at the beginning. But by the end, I'm hoping for a systematic difference because I did something to those people in the control, experimental group. So in the repeated measure, we would hope for a change in the scalars and the metrics would be the same. And then we look at what is the difference in the scalars? Which group went up or down on which items? And is that in accordance with my theoretical expectations of my experiment? Right? So your experiment might be designed to make uh, kids who agree with irrelevance to go down, to make them see, they'll go, Oh yeah, it's not so bad. It, it does matter. It does tell me something useful. I can use it to improve. So if your experiment is to help kids who hate tests, 
understand, not to like tests, but to understand how to use them, and the control group doesn't get this, and that they actually understand it, then their scores, their starting scores, should change for those scales that your experiment was designed to change. Okay, does that make sense? So, in a repeated measures, you're, you're hoping for configural and metric at time two. At time one, you definitely need configural metric and scalar. So you can say, there was no difference to start with, but by the end, there was a difference. And you can see the difference in the scalar. Does that make sense? But if it's a cross-section, group one, group two, are they the same? then you want all three. And if you can't get all three, then the questionnaire means something different to these two groups, and the two groups do not come from the same population. Okay. Lack of scalar equivalence is an indication. They're not the same, guys. Too bad, so sad. Now you have to figure out why they're not the same. And that's a publishable article, if you can figure out why they're not the same. It doesn't mean Oh my God, I have to throw it away. It means I have to think more. Maybe I need to do a follow-up study to find out why are the, what makes these two groups different. Maybe I need to go and observe them. Maybe I need to go and do some interviews. Right? It doesn't mean my scale fails. It just means you need to do more research. Right? So, systematic and sequel comparisons. If one is not true, then do not go to two. If two is not true, do not go to three. I said that. Is the unconstrained model admissible for both groups? There's no error for group one, no group two. Everything works. It's a configurally invariant. Are the regression weights the same? Metric invariants. Are the factor intercepts the same? Scalar invariants. Are the residual equivalent? Strict invariants but nobody cares. You just don't care. Because that's like saying, the universe of everything I didn't explain is identical to the universe of everything I didn't explain in these two groups, which is a kind of violation of the assumption that random is unexplained and uncorrelated and just, you know, so why would we want strict invariance? Okay, how do you know it's invariant? Well, you want the RMSEA to be less than 0.08, and in fact, in a lot of cases, a model with two groups will have an RMSEA under 0.05 as a strong indicator that, yeah, this model works better because you've allowed group one to be different to group two. When you run it as one group, you're saying group one and group two are, don't exist. They're just in the same group. But if you allow group one and group two to be free, then you might find group one is slightly different to group two, and all the group ones are more like each other than the group twos. So that by freeing that constraint up, the model fits the data better, because the data is slightly different for group one and group two. And you could imagine this could be younger students, older students, minority students, majority students, boys and girls, are not identical to start with. They're, you know, they're from the same population, but they're not necessarily the same people as a group. And allowing the groups to be free makes the model fit better. So you should run it as one group, look at the fit level, run it as two groups, did the fit get better? That tells you the groups have some differences. But is it too much different or just a little different? And there are two statistics. Is the change in chi-square, delta chi-square, given the change in degrees of freedom, delta df, statistically non-significant? But remember, chi-square is very sensitive, man gave a false negative. So, yeah, some people will report it. You should look at it. And if it's in your favor, of course report it. But if it's a contradiction, then you say, because of this oversensitivity of the chi-square statistic, emphasis will be put on the change in CFI. You know, 
<laughs> Again, this is tested sequentially. Model 2 is compared to no, model 1. Model 3 is compared to 2, and so on. These are the we are not worthy names of invariance testing, <coughs> and I am proud.